It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce the speaker of today, Professor John Dylan Haynes. He studied psychology and philosophy at the University of Bremen. His PhD was about the neurocorrelates of visual attention and awareness, and he had several research positions after that in several cities, Magdeburg, Bremen, and in the UK, where he also worked at the University College London at the Cognitive Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience. His work concerns the neural basis of visual awareness, perception, and uses several brain imaging technologies, and he will undoubtedly tell us more about those techniques this evening. He also conducted quite famous studies on the neural basis of free will, and he is a renowned researcher in neuroscience worldwide. In 2006, he was appointed as a professor for theory and analysis of large-scale brain signals in Berlin at the Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience, where he is also director of the Berlin Center of Advanced Neuroimaging. Thank you, and I look forward to the lecture. The floor is yours. You just said the floor is mine. It feels more like the pulpit is mine. So uh, this is a nice uh, symbol for the uh, overestimation that uh, currently neuroscience is undergoing, that people think that neuroscience is now going to replace theology and religion and psychology and everything. So um, a step ahead, despite the fact that I'm standing up here, I don't believe that that is the case. And I think that uh, neuroscience, psychology, and all these other fields are kind of happily working together. I'm not one of those neuroscientists who's going to claim that um, we're just going to need neuroscience in the future. Um, so now... So the topic I want to raise today is um, what we can find out about a person's thoughts if we just look at their brain, if we look, specifically if we look at their brain activity. And um, this uh, research um, has kind of been going on now for a couple of years. Um, and uh, the fact that the audience here is quite full, despite the fact that um, uh, I'm going to be presenting you some work that sometimes goes back a couple of years, shows that this topic um, enjoys a lot of interest, but also that the topic um, is um, uh, kind of uh, uh, quite heavily of uh, uh, interest in the public media and things like that. And people often have quite wrong impressions of what you can do with brain scanners. And what I'd like to, you to take home from this um, uh, lecture today is to get a realistic picture of what you can and what you can't do, while at the same time I want to share my passion uh, for this research field. So, most current neuroscientists would say that our thoughts happen in our brain. Yeah? The thoughts don't happen in our gut, even if we sometimes have gut feelings. We don't think that that's where the thoughts happen. And um, so the question is, let's go and look at the brain as the seat of our thoughts and try and see how we can find out what a person is currently thinking. How would you go about doing this? Well, first of all, you have to try and understand the way thoughts are coded in the brain. Now, this is an incredibly simplistic view, but I'd just like to share the basic intuition with you. And that is, if you look at a CD, the content on this CD, the music, is coded in the patterning on the surface of the CD with the bellies and pits. And um, if you have one piece of music, it has one pattern of pits on the surface of the CD. If you have a different uh, piece of music, it has a different pattern of pits on the surface of the CD. And similarly, if you look at people's thoughts, they're associated with very unique patterns of brain activity. So we can look into the brain, measure its activity, and find very unique signatures um, for specific thoughts, such as, for example, this memory that I have here on the bottom right of a um, holiday we had last year in uh, Santa Barbara, and uh, this picture of my son. So this specific memory is coded with a very specific pattern of brain activity in my brain. And... If I have a different memory, it's a different pattern of brain activity. And what we're going to see is that if you learn to analyze these patterns of brain activity, then you can find out about what a person is thinking, at least to some degree. So right at the beginning, I always like to show a very nice movie. Um, and this is a movie from the, this is an excerpt from the film uh, um, A Future World, uh, a movie from the 1970s. 
And the reason I find it interesting is that it captures the basic idea, the common sense understanding what we believe a brain reading or a mind reading machine would do if it were to exist. Yeah? So if we watch movies, obviously kind of the director here very nicely captures our intuitions. So let's see if this works. We call it our inner space chamber and we hope to make it a regular part of future world. The idea is to actually make a videotape of a dream. You take it with you, play it back, I know what you're thinking about. That is absolutely incredible. You want to try it? Go ahead, Sox, go for it. Oh, yes, yes, I do. You know, maybe I could use it on the program. I think you'll find it's a unique experience. Talk to you this way. You bet. I got to see this. Wait a minute, you mean he can watch? Unless you object. Well, I don't know whether I do or not. I mean, it depends on what I dream, doesn't it? Well, don't you worry about it. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> All right, wise guy. It's about time you learn something about women. This way. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure I won't have a nightmare? And this thing looks pretty frightening. Oh, well, we'll see to it if that doesn't happen. The couch is designed to remove any pressure along the neural spinal column. And the material bleeds air at the exact temperature of your body. So you'll see nothing, feel nothing, hear nothing. Your mind will begin to feed on itself. Hmm, with my luck, I won't be able to fall asleep. Bye. Every thought, like every eye blink or heartbeat, releases currents of electricity, which can be transformed into waves. She's got a lot on her mind, huh? Well, we're recording 2,000 different waves from 5,000 separate brain locations. Wow. Millions of bits of information. We take it all in and put it back together on this. What's this? Take a look. You know what you're seeing? I can't believe it. No, it's true. convert thought waves back into the images the mind creates. It isn't perfect, of course. It'll do. Wow. Activate the pain pleasure gradient, please. <laughs> Who's that? Reference, a fantasy lover. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Okay, so I wish I could stand here today and tell you that we've now finished building this machine in Berlin at the Charité, and you can just come and visit us and we can read out your dreams. Uh, uh, but we're not quite that far yet, but I'd like to kind of uh, share the basic science underlying this uh, research field um, uh, with you. So the basic idea is you measure a person's brain activity with some sophisticated form of brain scanner like this one here, you can see on the left. And then you measure patterns of brain activity, you take it all in, put it back together again, as they said in the movie, sounds really easy. Just take it all in, put it back together. That's just like you break a cup, you take the pieces, stick them together, and you've got your cup back. This is the same here, in theory at least. And then you know, you can reconstruct memories, say for example, of a person's ninth birthday. Well, today we measure brain activity with brain scanners, and you've got a very active um, brain imaging site here in Honingen. In fact, uh, I think it was in 98 or 99, I was considering coming here to do a PhD at the BNC because it's a kind of very famous place to come for neuroimaging. So we now have scanners in Germany as well, following by a couple of years. Um, and what you can see here is a person going through the typical brain scan. They're lying on their back. They go into this strong magnetic field. Uh, and we can measure their brain activity. Now, our ability to measure their brain activity with these scanners isn't perfect. It's far from perfect. Um, we can resolve the brain in little sugar cubes with a resolution of, say, one to three millimeters. So it's not that accurate. Um, but still, we can put people in scanners. We can measure the whole brain at once. And we can get people in the scanner to play little games, like, for example, um, you can kind of play games that measure people's ability to respond quickly to external stimuli. You can kind of test their intelligence, but measure various cognitive functions. But one thing you can try and do is try and find out what they're currently thinking. 
Now, to do this, you have to measure what you might refer to as images of brain activity, because this science is called brain imaging. But I don't want you to be misled into believing that what we do is we take a picture of a person's brain, and then we look at this picture, and then we try and find out what they're thinking. Yeah? Um, this is the impression you might easily get by hearing brain imaging and brain reading and all these kind of things. Uh, so be careful. Um, it's not like a radiologist taking, a, say, a CAT scan or something and trying to find out if you have a tumor. Uh, and one um, a, um, a journalist from Deutschlandfunk in Germany came to me once. She had a background in art history, and she was thinking that what we do is actually we print out the brain images, and then we put them on the wall, and we think about them, what they might mean, similar to an interpretation in art history. Yeah? Um, uh, that's not what we do. Um, I wish that was the case. Um, instead, what we do is we use brute force statistical techniques, so there's a lot of uh, data processing going to the images you're going to see. And then you see an image like this one. Now, this is a cut through the brain that shows you parts of the brain that are active um, when you're thinking about objects. So when you're perceiving objects, but also when you're imagining objects. Uh, the kind of red colors show you regions where you get above average activity, and the cold regions show you where you get below average activity. And the question is then, you measure this, but what does this really tell you? So what do you think this person is thinking about? What would you say? Does anyone have an idea? It would be very difficult if you just measure the planet. It's like the people looking at the hieroglyphs for the first time. You think, my God, this must mean something systematic, but I don't know what the hell this means. So we have to employ some kind of code breaking. The idea being that we have to somehow decipher what these patterns here mean by using some kind of code breaking technique, trying to map the um, patterns of brain activity to, um, uh, to the thoughts that a person has. And this is a couple, some data from, very old data from Jim Haxby's lab, one of the first people who did this kind of research. And um, what you can see on the left is pictures that people were looking at in a scanner. And the second row shows um, the patterns of brain activity that you get when people are looking at these images in the scanner. And first of all, they look kind of similar. It's the same part of the brain that's active. Um, but it seems that there's not like a face area, a house area, uh, a chair area, or a shoe area, something very specific that only lights up when you have that corresponding thought. And there's no cat area and no mouse area. Uh, no romantic love era, really. Instead, what happens is if you have a certain thought, then you get a whole spatial pattern of brain activity. Lots of parts of the brain become active. And then you get parts, some parts of the brain that represent the specific details of what you're thinking about. So you can look at the details of the activation for the face and the details of the activation for the house. And they're kind of similar, but they're also different. There are some differences. And this is what you have to learn to exploit. And you exploit this by feeding this into pattern recognition algorithms. Now, very similar to recognizing fingerprints based on the spatial profiles uh, on the person's finger, uh, you can then uh, train a computer using very similar software to um, recognize the uh, thoughts that a person has from the spatial patterns of brain activity. Um, so you feed it, uh, you feed the same computer software these patterns of brain activity, and then you kind of label them, and then the computer has to prove that it can do this. You can, you can claim all sorts of things, like, for example, the company Noli MRI claims that you can build a, 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 a lie detector with MRI. The proof is, can you really do it? So let's have a look. This is the same person thinking about one of these four objects, and what would you say this person is um, thinking about? Exactly, and you've done something now. You've done pattern recognition with your brain, and our brains are very good at pattern recognition. Uh, and um, what you've presumably done is you've looked at the pattern in the top right, and you've compared it to the individual rows in the left, and you said, well, it looks most similar to the one that's activated with the chair, and that's correct. And in fact, the person was looking at a chair, and that's what the pattern classifier says in this case. So this is just a very simple sketch. You just learn the patterns of brain activity, and you feed them into a computer, and with associated labels being the thoughts that a person has. And then, to some degree, you can re-decode re what a person is thinking. In this case here, in this limited case here, you could tell which of these four, or in this study I think it was eight, different objects a person was looking at. So, of course, you have to know what the patterns look like before you can decode this. Now, taking this a few steps further, uh, Nishimoto and Gallant uh, from Berkeley University in the USA have a very nice example of kind of the, almost you could say the cutting edge of what you can do with reconstructing 
um, a person's uh, kind of visual experiences, at least, from brain activity patterns. And what you're going to see in a second is um, you're going to see um, a, a video and you're going to see the reconstruction of this video from brain activity alone. So this is what you might say a more sophisticated version of the decoder. Now the decoder kind of can de decode many more um, visual experiences than it was originally trained with. Now, um, what you're going to see is you're going to see a very complicated movie. And like you just to pay attention to the left, and what you're going to see in the top left, you're going to see the video that people were looking at. And on the left, on, below that, you're going to see three rows with three different subjects, and you're going to see the reconstruction from brain activity, what the person was uh, seeing, so from brain activity alone. And it's dynamic. That's the beauty of it. Uh, it's the kind of nicest example of dynamic decoding so far. So just pay attention to the left row, this work by Nishimoto and Gallant and other colleagues. We have to start it. <laughs> we had to kind of download the video again, unfortunately. So if you just pay attention, this is the video that they were viewing. And this here on the left, these three videos, these videos here on the left, are what the computer thinks based on the brain activity, what the person is seeing. So what you can say is, you can say, well, this is not very good because it's not exactly what the person was seeing, but I think you would agree that it's actually fairly accurate. So it's a reasonably captures the kind of spatial structure of what the people are looking at. Not necessarily the full details of the semantics or the meaning of what they're looking at, but to some degree it captures the kind of basic structure. And these are kind of um, videos that this computer wasn't trained on. So it works quite well even in cases where you don't know exactly which brain activity pattern goes with which um, uh, uh, visual content. So we've used this now to do not um, this kind of direct decoding per se, kind of visual experiences the person has like in the, uh, like in the film you just saw, but to answer some basic questions in cognitive neuroscience. And one of the big discussions in cognitive neuroscience from very early days was the so-called visual imagery debate. Uh, you had on the one hand, you had someone, his name was Zenon Pilishin, and he had the idea that you basically the brain, well not even the brain, the mind operates like a computer, like a little computer program going on in your head. And every time you conjure up something from your memory and you imagine it vividly, say for example a scene where you're looking out into your living room, uh, that then a computer program uh, goes off in your brain, uh, and then that's basically what determines what you're seeing. On the other hand, uh, you have people like Stephen Coslin, they had the idea that what happens when you imagine something is to use exactly the same networks, the same representations that you use when you actually perceive something. So if you're looking out into your, if you're imagining your living room, the same parts of the brain become active when, as when you're actually seeing it. And so we uh, got people in the scanner and told them to imagine a number of different objects. So they weren't seeing them in one condition, they were just purely imagining them. And um, we trained the computer to recognize these uh, imaginations that they had based on a computer trained on situations where the person was really shown these pictures. So you show, you show the person a picture of a watch, a chair, a bus, etc. You learn these patterns of brain activity from when they're looking at something in reality, so veridical perception, that's what it's called. And then you apply it to a situation where they're just imagining. And now if the code is the same, for imagining and perceiving, the classifier should work. It should be able to predict your uh, experiences under ima imagination just as well, or at least to some degree, as um, under vertical perception. That's actually what you see. You can see that here. The yellow bars show you the decoding accuracy in a number of brain areas that are specialized in processing thoughts about kind of complex objects and faces and so on. So this works to some degree. It doesn't work perfectly. Uh, and one of the reasons it doesn't work perfectly is because the imagination, presumably, isn't exactly the same as what you perceive. So the classifier learns what it looks like when you're really perceiving it, but actually the imagination doesn't, is, is not quite the same. It doesn't have the same sense of detail, for example, if you imagine something. So um, taking it from there, sorry, this went one too far. Colleagues um, in uh, Japan uh, have been able to take a first stab in an age-old riddle, which is the, the idea if you could decode a person's dream contents. So 
The video you just saw was one where um, the journalist goes in this, this kind of fictitious, fictitious um, brain scanner and um, uh, then uh, goes to sleep and then we read out this person's dreams. So is this possible? Well, this is a study where um, they measured people's brain activity in situations not in deep sleep. That wasn't possible because you wouldn't know what a person is thinking about or dreaming about. But they measured their brain activity while they were just nodding off. They were just kind of on the verge of falling asleep. And just when they fell asleep, they kind of woke them up again. And they, they kind of measured their brain activity during this brief sleep period. And they tried to classify it. And they could, for example, tell roughly which category the person was thinking about. So to some degree, it's even possible to measure very, very simple forms of vivid um, visual experiences during dreaming, but not during deep sleep. Uh, well, deep, deep sleep, you wouldn't be dreaming anyway, during REM sleep. So taking it from there, uh, our lab tried to look at other kinds of um, uh, uh, mental representations, mental contents that might be of interest. So you could say, well, it's nice to see these visual images that you can decode, but what about more interesting questions, such as, for example, if I can tell what, not what a person is seeing, well, I know that anyway, because I can see what they're looking at, but if I want to find out what they're going to do, this has all sorts of possible practical applications. So we will put, put people in a brain scanner, uh, and I'm going to simplify this experiment tremendously in the interest of time. We put people in a brain scanner, and we got them to do very simple decisions, and I'd like to ask you to join me in this simple experiment so now you're all going to have to come out of your passive role, please. And um, I'd like you to use your free will that you've all brought here from home. And please now, at some point that you can freely choose, spontaneously choose whether you want to lift the left or right arm and then immediately lift it. Good, so we see it lefts and rights, and we see various times when people make their decisions. That's exactly like in our experiment. And would, who, please lift your arm if you had the impression that this was a free decision. And who had the impression this was an unfree decision? Okay, so it's roughly 50-50. Good. So, we put people in a brain scanner while they were making these decisions, and... Um, we um, uh, tried to somehow measure the time when they made up their mind. And to do this, um, we had a little stream of letters running on the fixation uh, in the scanner, so they were kind of updated every half second. And people had to just memorize which um, letter was on the screen when they made up their mind. And so this gave us a marker when they made up their mind, so then we knew exactly when they made up their mind. And we put them in the brain scanner while they're doing this, and what we find is that there are parts of the brain, specifically in prefrontal cortex and in parietal cortex, so higher level planning areas of the brain, where we can predict to some degree, at least, seven seconds before a person is, thinks that they make up their mind, which choice they're going to take. So you think, well, I'm making up my mind now, but your brain is partially giving you away seven seconds before. Not perfectly, this is a point that we could discuss, but um, at least there seems to be at least a tendency for your brain to start preparing for the outcome of a decision that you yourself don't even know what it's going to be. That sounds kind of uh, strange, right? If you're free to make up your mind at this point in time, how can your brain could have predicted what you're going to do? That's why these experiments often get discussed in the context of free will. Now, just discussing the applicability of these studies for free will would take a whole evening, so I'm going to spare you this full debate. I just want to raise, you, uh, raise the awareness that the basic question that this um, kind of experiment uh, speaks to is that we tend to have this intuition, a kind of, sometimes you might think of this as a rather kind of, if you think about it in detail, a kind of, uh, it might be a kind of um, irrational, uh, a basic assumption anyway, but Often people in their day-to-day -day lives have this kind of intuition, and that is, you first make your decision in your mind, and then your body starts moving. You lift your hand. Whereas these experiments suggest an alternate model, that is, that your brain activity starts first, it starts preparing the decision, then your mind kicks in, and then your body moves. So the initial starting point, the ignition point for this decision might not be your mind, but instead it might actually be your brain that's kind of driving you towards one or the other decision. Now, this is 
um, a debate that's going on, and there's lots of positions in this debate, and I think uh, there's lots of experiments still to be done in this debate. For example, the fact that we can't predict perfectly could have a number of reasons. One of these reasons could be that, in fact, the brain hasn't really fully decided that early what you're going to do, but it's just kind of nudging you in one or the other direction, like a gentle nudge. Another possibility is that the brain has actually fully decided what you're going to do, and it's just our inaccuracy in our measurement techniques that not, don't allow us to um, kind of see the full detail of the predictability of your choices. So to get at this time period, um, seven seconds seems a long period of time. So if your brain starts preparing a decision now and your mind comes in seven seconds later, it seems that of course you should be able to change your mind, right? If my brain is making a decision, preparing a decision now, why would I not be able to change my mind in the meantime? I've got seven seconds. I mean, I can easily change my mind in seven seconds. Well, the reason is because at that time, you don't know what the decision is because it's not conscious yet. You don't know what, how to change your mind if you don't know what the other option was. You know? If you know you have to take one of two options and uh, you, you change your mind, well, I don't, know if, I don't know if I was going to take left or right. So that's already quite tricky. Um, but we decided to do an experiment on this and uh, uh, kind of uh, tackle this issue in a little bit more detail, kind of how um, well can people overcome the predictability by their brain. And we set them a very simple challenge. Now, this is a sketch of the experiment we did. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to simplify it. And the basic idea is the following. You give people a button and you tell them, please press this button. The button is attached to a light. And you can press the button to earn points. And if you press the button, the light is off, you get a point. And if you press the button, the light is on, we get a point, or you lose a point. Sounds very easy. You can make points, yeah? That's your challenge. Now, sneakily, we measure people's brain activity, <laughs> and then we find out from their brain activity, we decode when they're going to make up their mind. And just about when they're just about to press the button, we know, ah, oh, now they're going to do it, and we turn on the light, and they lose their points. That's the basic idea of this experiment. And it took us quite a while to get it set up because you can't really do it with fMRI because fMRI is too slow for this. Um, uh, so we used EEG and we teamed up with a brain-computer interface uh, research group in Berlin at the Technical University with uh, Benjamin Blankertz. And um, this is the uh, outcome of this experiment. So what you can see on the left is a period where we're giving feedback, we're kind of turning the light on stochastically. And you can see people make lots of points. This is kind of average points per second. Then we start turning on the predictor, and suddenly people can't make any points anymore. So we're kind of beating them. We're not kind of we're not getting them below the kind of uh, 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 zero line. So basically, um, it kind of like it's on par. They can sometimes be predicted, and sometimes they're unpredictable, and kind of it roughly matches each other. But this was the first experiment. Of course, we're hoping to kind of push this in the negative so that we can then really earn points and possibly we can start earn, turning this into an experiment where we can earn money, like a challenge. Yeah? Uh, if you manage to uh, do this, um, uh, get, you get 100 points, you get 10 euros or something like that. You know, on the, um, uh, uh, on the fairgrounds where you have these bicycles, where you, they, you kind of, they invert the direction. You kind of turn them left and the wheel goes right and the other way around. Do you know this? And it's basically you can't do it. And people try and try and try and try again and they kind of, they can't overcome their routines. So the basic idea is perhaps we can one day take this to the fairgrounds and uh, have this as a little amusement um, to see if we, can, uh, if we can earn money for our research in this way. <laughs> okay, so what I've shown you is a couple of examples, uh, visual experiences, imagination um, and intentions where we can decode people's um, thoughts from their brain activity, at least within these very constrained conditions. So the question I'd like to ask now is how far, and this now comes to kind of reflecting part, the kind of more critical part, how far are we really from realizing this machine that you saw in the movie? You know? Can we now, can you go to the BCN neuroimaging department and you say, come on, please, I always wanted to know what I dream, please scan me and tell me what I'm thinking about while I'm dreaming because I can't remember my dreams. Yeah? What is this kind of application possible nowadays? And um, let's look at a couple of limitations first. The challenge is, I mean, if you look at limitations, um, there's kind of a, one of the, they kind of, you can free formulate them as interesting directions for research, things you need to find out in order to push the boundary of the possibilities here. 
So now one of the limitations I've already mentioned is lim limited resolution of neuroimaging studies. We can't really get down to the level of single neurons. So presumably, if we could measure every single one of the, on average, 86 billion neurons that the average person has, then we could possibly get their thoughts in much more detail. Yeah? In fact, it's quite surprising how far we can get with these limited neuroimaging techniques that we have. Mobility. If you want to design an application, I don't think you're going to want to run around with a brain scanner on your head. Yeah? It's not the kind of thing that, oh, which product are you going to buy? Uh, oh, wait a minute, I just want to look in my brain scanner. I'm just going to strap it on my head. It weighs 15 tons. It's not, it's not very practical for mobile applications. So EG and the infrared spectroscopy could be a much better for mobile applications. But there are a couple of, besides these more technical issues, there are kind of really fundamental challenges in this field. And one of the fundamental challenges is things we don't know about the way the information is coded, like basic questions that we still don't have a good answer to yet. So just imagine the question, like, say, in the bottom left, you see a fictitious pattern of brain activity while a person is... Um, thinking about their favorite movie, Lassie, or think about their favorite food, uh, uh, hamburger, or think about their favorite movie, Heavy Metal. From this choice, you might guess that this is supposed to be a young person in the young periods of their life, Lassie, hamburger, heavy metal. That's the kind of things that are on your mind when you're young. I'm sure it's the same here in Holland. Uh, the kind of Febo hamburger. And um, when you grow older, you grow kind of your taste changes, and you might like uh, schmaltzy German movies, you kind of like different music, and you've kind of changed your diet, and you've kind of tricked yourself into believing that you like this kind of salad dish. Yeah? So the question is what we don't really know is how stable these coding spaces are across changes and across plasticity. There's not very much known about this. We know a lot about plasticity in the brain. Um, there's lots of research on plasticity. What we don't know that much about is if these coding spaces reshape. For example, if something changes by gaining new associations. Uh, or you, you have a dog at home, you love your dog, it's got positive associations, and then suddenly you meet a dog on the street and it bites you. Does this change your coding space for job? Presumably, yes, because you're going to have different associations like anticipated pain and memories of pain and things like that. But this isn't really well understood at the moment. Another problem is that the patterns of brain activity coding different thoughts are quite different from person to person. So if you look at your neighbor, your coding space and your neighbor's coding space is different. Yeah? If you both just think about a cat, a dog, a mouse, or face, chair, whatever, then you are coding this in your brain in a different way than your neighbor. Now, the difficult bit is it's different, but it's not completely different. It's also kind of similar. So it's the kind of thing that, kind of, if you talk to a journalist about this, they want it to be black and white, and uh, they just kind of—it's a bit difficult. So it's kind of thing that's a bit hard to communicate. It's not completely different, and it's not completely the same. It's halfway between the two. Um, some things are more similar. If you go to the more and more details about your thoughts, if you want to read out more and more details, the more fine-grained details seem to be more different across individuals. So that is a basic thing. So this is another unsolved problem because just imagine earlier on the woman, she went into the brain scanner and she hadn't been in that brain scanner before. So how could the computer know how her individual brain codes these thoughts? That's a problem that is currently not solved yet. Another problem is superposition. Uh, all sorts of things happening at the same time in your mind. How do they superimpose? Another thing that we don't really know very much about. But one of the big challenges is um, what you might refer to the tremendous um, creativity of human thought to generate new ideas. My favorite uh, is the sentence, my, this hovercraft is full of eels, which is a, a Monty Python um, citation. Um, I'm sure if you were to build a brain scanner that kind of learns patterns of brain activity for different situations where they might be useful, this hovercraft is, well, my hovercraft is full of eels, will not be one that you would have anticipated to encounter. Uh, it's like, oh, yes, we need to measure the, my hovercraft is full of eels mental representation in the brain. That kind of just shows how difficult it is to kind of know in advance what kind of things people might be thinking about and to kind of hold the coding space ready for all these different thoughts. Now, there's one way, at least for very simple uh, thoughts, to uh, overcome this problem, and that is 
you can just illustrate it by this, uh, by this graph here. Let's just say you've measured, and this is fictitious data, this is just a kind of blown up to sketch it, but it's the same thing holds true actually for the way in which the brain codes information at a more detailed level. So in the top right, this is what you've measured, say, a pattern of brain activity when a person thinks about a car, and in the bottom right, a pattern of brain activity when a person thinks about a bicycle. Well, you know those, but now this person is imagining something that you just don't know what it is. You've never seen it before. It's in the middle line. But what do you think it might be? Exactly. So what's a mix between um, the uh, car and a bicycle? What might that be? Yes, excellent, perfect. A Brumfietzen, yeah? The Dutch word that all Germans are obsessed by. Um, so that's the basic idea. Um, you measure, you don't need to know everything. You can operate with interpolation. Yeah, you can just kind of know a few and then you can infer some others from that. Now, this actually works quite well. And uh, some research done by Marcel Joss and Tom Mitchell from Carnegie Mellon University shows that this approach can actually be taken quite far. So, I've shown you the limitations now. I've tried to show you my enthusiasm, but I've shown you the limitations. Now I'd also like to talk about uh, something that kind of gets permanently raised, that is the question of applications. If we can read out a person's thoughts from their brain activity, at least to some degree, can this be used to turn venture capital into money for everyone? <coughs> can we now make lots of money with this? Yeah, that's what some people are trying to do. So some people are trying to help for example, by finding out if coma patients have experiences or not of waking coma, persistent vegetative state coma patients. <coughs> Others have tried to sell gaming products, for example, this brain ball game, um, where you can control and levitate a ball based on thought control. It doesn't work quite the way the company claims it worked. We tried it out um, uh, in, in our lab in Berlin. Um, so gaming is another application. Can you control a game just based on your brain activity? Can you find out if someone's been at a crime scene at the top right? Forensic applications? <coughs> so now you can see they're getting more and more um, uh, kind of uh, ethically difficult. Or should we be able to, uh, and can we um, find out which product a person likes based on their brain activity? Can we predict purchase decisions? So why don't we just play a game and just say, who thinks it's okay for brain scanners and decoders to be used to help to find out if people are experiencing something about their environment when they're in a, when they're in a, when they're in a coma? Who says that will be okay? Now, everyone who doesn't lift their arm is going to be uh, held responsible for these poor people. So let's let's take it further. Gaming. What about gaming? Should it be okay to use it in gaming industry? Okay. Less. What about crime scene recognition? Has someone been at a crime scene or not? Okay, good, good. It was a project we did actually started with Mart Bless, who was a PhD, uh, postdoc from, uh, from uh, Maastricht. And brain marketing, who thinks it should be okay to do this, brain marketing? Okay, I guess that gets the lowest number of votes. So just to take you through a couple of potential applications. So we can't, of course, for a lot of these applications, build a perfect decoder. I showed you, we can do something, we can read out something, and we can read out systematically, and something's better, and something's worse, and we can predict sometimes. But we can't read out the full details in real time as it would be needed in this movie. But for a lot of these applications, we don't need to do that. For the persistent vegetative state, it's just okay if you know roughly if the person's experiencing something or not. You don't need to know all the details what they're thinking about. And in crime scene recognition, you don't need to know all the details of their thoughts about the crime scene. You just need to know, does this brain recognize this crime scene or not? And the same with brain marketing. So a lot of these questions can be boiled down to simple yes-no questions, yeah? yes or no. Whereas the kind of difficulties I discussed earlier on, they're more kind of this fundamental nature. We can't get into all this detail, like reconstruct our experiences in a movie. But some of the applications just need zero or one, yes or no. So just to show you a couple of um, interesting aspects here. So this is a study done uh, uh, by some colleagues. Um, it's basically asking the question whether you can find out from an EEG that a person is uh, uh, using during a video game. So this is something that's becoming fashionable at the moment. If you can find out a person's PIN number 
or which people they like and things like that, without them um, uh, consenting to this, then wanting to reveal this information. So imagine with these modern computer games where you use brain computer interfaces, so very simple EEG caps to control an aspect of your video game, you kind of, you can possibly, and that's what they discuss here and that they show to some degree at least, you can read out sensitive information by looking at the brain response, for example, the person's PIN number. Yeah? So um, that shows that this is quite sensitive. And um, one of the big questions is, of course, can you possibly predict criminal behavior? Can you find out if someone's going to do something bad in the future and then possibly even stop it? Well, one of the difficulties with this is we can read out intentions to some degree, but not all sorts of arbitrary intentions that people might have. And one of the biggest issues is that we don't know how committed someone is to pursuing that intention. We don't know if they're thinking about the intention. We don't know if they're really going to go and do it. Yeah? If you take the example of a person carrying a bomb on the plane. This is questions I've been asked in the, in the past. Can we find this out with a kind of intention decoder? Well, at the moment, we don't know if we can find the difference between someone is thinking about carrying a bomb on the plane and blowing up the plane, but this plane that they're going to get on now, someone who's thinking about blowing up a plane, but they're going to blow up a plane next week, someone who's just thinking about blowing up a plane as a compulsive thought because they know that there's a brain scanner, and as soon as it takes someone to think about blowing up a plane, they're going to not be able to go on the plane, and that, of course, makes them think about the plane. Yeah? All these different situations are quite... It's, we don't know yet if we can separate these different situations. So it's quite tricky then that uh, in the uh, market, um, uh, venture capital has been used in the past to set up companies that claim, for example, that they can do lie detection based on brain scans. This is very problematic because to date there is no real validation that the techniques that these people use work in the real world. I don't mean in the lab. We've done similar experiments in the lab. Uh, so you can see here on the left, this is a kind of hypothetical timeline. In the left, you can see that lies can be detected in laboratory experiments. People laying, lying about whether they've seen playing cards or not in a laboratory situation. Students. I mean, very restricted, impoverished situation. Um, but in a lot of these cases, you have exactly the same problem we have in translational research in taking a pharmaceutical from the mouse to the bedside. It's translational research. You have exactly the same problem here. Just because you show something works in the lab, it doesn't mean you can immediately take it into an application. That's why it's very dangerous that um, the subtleties don't always get communicated, that the applications, despite the fact that this basic research aspects are there, um, the subtleties and the kind of challenges of kind of taking it in a reliable way into a real-world application aren't really appreciated today. So you need to go through real-world testing. In the case of um, lie detection, it's very difficult because what counts is the real world with a lie detector. You know? And um, so finally, in order to kind of come up with a product that is reliable, I think that's still going to take quite a while. Finally, I'd just like to mention that people often feel that lurking beneath the surface of this topic, there is the question of not just kind of reading, but also manipulating people. If someone can read my thoughts out, this is really difficult. Yeah, I feel I might be an open book. Someone can manipulate me. And possibly someone can just use the brain scanner, now I'm talking very popular psychology here, use the brain scanner to put thoughts in my brain, not just read them out, but put them in the brain. Like you can see in several popular movies, like for example in the film Strange Days, where people are wearing caps and they can record their thoughts with these caps, but they can also play back thought, their kind of experiences. So you just need some kind of way of writing the patterns of brain activity into the brain. And this is something, so we need recording and we need playback. And the playback, that's the even bigger issue. And the reason is because we, the thoughts that people have are coded in these detailed spatial patterns of brain activity. To date, we don't have a technique, not even remotely an idea what that technique might be to write detailed patterns of brain activity into the human brain. What we can do is we can do very crude measures of like hitting the brain with a hammer on the on kind of like bang, this like transcranial magnetic stimulation. It does something, we have a rough idea what it does, but we don't know exactly what it does. And it can't be controlled in a way that is so detailed that you could write in a pattern of activity and deactivation into the brain. So it's not quite clear how that would work, really. So 
no worries here. While we're talking about worries, I'd like to mention no worries in general. So despite what I've showed you so far, um, I hope I've kind of raised your interest for this really exciting topic. But uh, at the moment, there's no need to worry about going to your radiologist and having your regular scan to see if you have a tumor or whatever, or having a baby or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, to date, it's not possible to read out the kind of details of your thoughts against your will. Thanks. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk and your reassuring conclusion. Uh, I would like to open the floor for questions and discussion. Any questions there? Uh, you mentioned that uh, prior to uh, someone actually deciding something, you can uh, already see what he uh, is going to decide, right? But what if uh, the decision has to be made uh, suddenly, like when you are about to hit a car with your own car on the, on the traffic? Yeah, this is what I was trying to um, uh, hint at when I said that this is a talk about this experiment is a bit difficult because there's like a whole talk just on that experiment. So the basic idea is that. Um, you have a situation where you can decide on your own pace. That's why we've seen this so far. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that the brain always needs seven seconds to make a decision. It's not like a reaction time or something like that, because that couldn't be true, because you can do a psychology experiment and react in like 250, 300 milliseconds very easily. And you can drive a car and react quickly to an external situation, like someone driving in front of you and you have to switch the lane. That's possible, and there's no seven second delay in there. So. The quick, de rapid decisions, say for example, do you want coffee or tea, you can quickly respond to that. You don't need seven seconds to do that. But despite the fact that um, this is, you can react quickly, it doesn't mean that there are not things that predict your decisions across longer periods of time. In fact, I think the fact that we can predict some decisions seven seconds is only a starting point I think we should be able to make our way back much further. For example, if I ask you coffee or tea, then you might say coffee because that's what you do every day. So possibly five years ago, I would have been able to predict that you're going to say coffee today. So simply the fact that decisions are made across a long time doesn't mean that you can't respond rapidly and to an external event. It might still be coded or in your brain activity across longer periods of time. Yeah? You mentioned using this technology as a lie detector. Ah, there. Okay. You mentioned using this, this technology as a lie detector. Do you think that could be uh, make make perfect? And more importantly, could you beat it? Well, another. You could talk a whole evening about just that topic. It's a very interesting topic. Um, so what's happened so far is people have um, been able to decode simple laboratory lies. And then there are two companies trying to sell lie detection services uh, So in the US. Um, there's a new company in Switzerland that um, claims that they can also find out if someone is lying about being depressive and kind of claiming an early uh, pension and things like that. So there are these people who claim that they can do this. Um, I think the problem is that what we need is real world data in order to find out if we can really do this. For me, I'm agnostic about this. Uh, I don't know if we can or if we can't uh, do this in a real world situation. Uh, we just need to get the data and see how good we perform. So I'm really data driven in that respect. Um, the problem is getting this data. Because the data should be on a situation where a person is in exactly the same situation where they would do this in the real world. They have to be just as nervous. It has to be the same population, so possibly more antisocial personality disorders, kind of flat emotions, things like that, trying to um, not be uncovered. All these things will be different in the real world, and so you need a real world sample. And it's actually very difficult to get to these real world samples because you need to all sorts of people get involved in that kind of research. Like if you take a criminal, you have all sorts of people who want to have a say in whether you can do this experiment or not. So it's very difficult to actually get the databases for this. 
and then when we have the databases, then we can make an informed decision. At the moment, I think we don't have, we can't make an informed decision. At least, but like that. Possibly these companies are doing a great job. They have all the data hidden away. They're just not showing it to anyone because it's their competitive intelligence. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, possibly they're just making a claim that they can't hold up. Just doesn't hold up to scrutiny, and they're just claiming that they can do lie detection. How are you going to find out? Yeah. How would you know? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I have a question about the Biermann and colleagues study, so with the light bulb uh, where you had to beat the machine. So I'm very much looking forward to reading this study, um, but I'm asking, I'm wondering whether it's really necessary to use the EEG because uh, if you were measuring the muscle, the tissue activity, for example, I think it should be several um, dozen of milliseconds faster than, than the bulb, right? So what's, is there a special trick? That no, no, the, point is, the point is, of course, it's only useful if you can predict ahead of the EMG. Otherwise, it's uh, pointless. So that's yeah. what you compare to, to the EMG? Yeah, yeah. That's, it's, you, you, can't, you, do it, you do it with or without the EMG, so you can kind of look at different stages of the prediction. And um, the point is that you can see how early you can get ahead of the EMG. And you can beat, uh, in this early time period, you can beat the subject as well. Yeah. And can you tell how early can you go back in time? What's the difference? Uh, it's on the order of like 100, 200 milliseconds before the EMG. So it's kind of a kind of mental time. It's kind of, you can think of it as a long time or a short time, yeah? Because it's not really time that you have under conscious control and there's this kind of small time periods. But um, you can go back like 100, 200 milliseconds before, before the... There's, there's always a threshold issue involved in making a claim about this timing issue because you can... You can kind of have, you can, on your ROC curve, you can make different choices. Yeah. So, um, this, this seven second prediction, how much of that is related to, uh, to actually the motor function of pressing the button and how much of the mental activity of taking the decision? Um, well, it's quite clear that these early predictive signals are not related to the motor preparation. And the reason is that you know, we know from other studies, when people are preparing to make a motor, make a movement, and they know what they're going to do, they're just waiting to do the movement, then you pre-activate all the way to primary motor cortex, so all the way into the motor areas of your brain. Um, we don't see that. The motor areas kick in very late. So it doesn't like, like they're deciding early and then they're just waiting seven seconds to press the button. That doesn't seem, that's not supported by our data. Thank you. There was a question here in the, in the front. Well, when you are asking a question that also has an impact on the answer. So when you, the way in which you uh, ask a question should also be included in the in the whole thing, because uh, by asking a question in a certain way, you can already predict sometimes what the answer, whether you're on coffee or tea, you know. The way you ask has an Im influence on the uh, question, so you can predict already uh, by a different way, I thought. Yeah, I mean, there, there are indeed lots of ways in which you can predict people's decisions. Yeah. Um, for yeah. example, by biasing them towards one option. If you say, do you want coffee or tea? Yeah, Obviously, right. no one's going to say, yeah, I'm going to have tea. Yeah. <laughs> but um, these are situations where the alternatives are quite, um, there's, no, there's no bias towards one of okay. the other decisions. So you should ask in a very objective, neutral way. Exactly, exactly. So the way these questions get asked is in a maximally neutral way. And okay. we do it repeatedly so that that's not the variable driving our results. Okay. But I fully agree that these kind of suggestive influences yeah. and yeah. rhetorics play a big Should role. Be. And you can easily manipulate people yeah. into making certain answers by just using the right words. Okay, thank you. What I like the most common confounds you experience when working with the MRI technique in the lab and also what are the latest sort of cutting edge um, developments when it comes to brain scanning techniques in general? What could we expect in the next couple of years? <laughs> Do 
Well, 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 yeah. <laughs> this, we can go off the record here. <laughs> well, I would say the, the basic principles of neuroimaging haven't changed that dramatically over the last 20 years. Um, the machines have gotten, you've gotten stronger fields, parallel imaging, some things have changed, but the machines have become more robust. But I think actually over the last 20 years, the biggest developments have been done in terms of analysis techniques, not so much in terms of recording techniques. And the problem with fMRI specifically is that you hit a biological barrier. And the biological barrier is that you're not measuring neuron activity, but you're measuring the fact that neurons change the oxygen content of the blood that changes their magnetism or magnetic properties. And so you're measuring a slightly indirect signal there. And um, because it's related to blood, it's related to the vasculature, so the blood vessels, and they have a limited resolution. So you kind of hit a barrier there. And um, some people hope that with kind of seven Tesla or higher field strengths, this is going to miraculously disappear. I think then we would see lots and lots and lots of studies done with seven Tesla study scanners because lots of them have been bought. But they're not that like same stream of studies coming out with seven Tesla. Well, I'm talking about functional imaging now. Obviously, seven Tesla scanners are great for structural imaging and for spectroscopy, but for functional imaging, I don't think at the moment, I mean, if you have a seven Tesla scanner, you're gonna say, I'm gonna kill this guy, what he's saying here, but I don't think that it's so far found the killer application for functional imaging. So if I was asked, what's the big new thing? I don't know, I'd say I think it's analysis techniques. I think people have becoming started using more intelligent analysis techniques and asking more intelligent questions. Um, actually, I forgot my question. <laughs> Luckily, I wrote it down. So, actually, there are several questions. Yeah? You can hold it. Uh, can we somehow shorten the time for taking a decision? How we can train our brain reaction? Uh, does it worth to live like that, thinking about something too long? And isn't it killing our time and patience? Thank what was you. the last one? Uh, isn't it killing our time and patience uh, thinking too long? I, I, th I didn't understand, like, acoustically. Uh, like, we're spending on taking decisions seven seconds, right? Okay, the betting study. So, yeah, doesn't yeah. it kill time or we should train our brains somehow? somehow. You, you mean, basically, it's wasting time? Yes, definitely. I wouldn't say it's wasting time because, um, uh, of course, it's a nice challenge and people like to play funny games on their mobile phones and computers that waste time, like Angry Birds or whatever. <laughs> I think that's more of a time waster than this kind of, ex this, this kind of experiment. Um, the question whether we can kind of get ourselves to respond quicker, that's, I think, at the heart of the experiment that we're doing with the real-time prediction. So trying to push people in a situation where they have to be maximally unpredictable. Now, I realize that that is not exactly the same as asking the question of free will. It's actually quite a different question. But um, that's kind of at the heart of this, is how unpredictable can people build, how can they quickly, how fast can they go from making the decision to responding? So that's something that this kind of experiment would, um, would address. Uh, but is it possible in everyday life to train ourselves somehow to make the decision faster? Is the main point. <laughs> Like, uh, that's, that's a very difficult question to, uh, to ask because it, it kind of depends on what kind of decision you're talking about. Yeah? So um, uh, some people would say that you trust your intuitions and you kind of, if you've kind of looked at something for a brief period of time, you kind of think about it deliberately. There's kind of uh, someone from, from Holland at Dexter House who kind of has this position that uh, then thinking about it can be bad. Now, not thinking about it too much can be better under certain situations if kind of decision is complex. Uh, and then other people show that this might be true, but if you make your decision straight away, then you're just as good. So sometimes in complex situations, you don't benefit that much from taking more time. Um, might be say something about board meetings or group meetings, basically get everyone around a table, ask them what they want, and then just kind of uh, go by the majority vote. Because that might be a way to speed up decisions. Um, I'm just curious, uh, could you, uh, I mean, is it possible to extract thoughts or memories out of uh, the brain of a dead person? No. 
in theory, similar to asking the question is, if you could travel backwards in time and be there at the time of the Big Bang, you would think, well, yeah, in some way I can think of this being possible, but in other ways it seems very hard to imagine this being feasible. Um, I think that's the same. So in theory, you would say, well, if the, if the wiring pattern between all these neurons is what codes your memories, then if you could find some way in order to reconstruct the exact wiring pattern of this brain, first, big step, very difficult, and then figure a way out to go from this wiring pattern to what a person is thinking about, or the latent memories, because they're not thinking about anything anymore, very difficult. Yeah. But in, I mean, of course, as a scientist, you believe that the basic idea would be true, but in the brain structure of a person who's deceased like one minute ago, would give away the memory content of this person if you knew how to read it out. So in theory, it should be possible, but it's not really feasible. Yeah, um, as you mentioned already, um, your thoughts over time might change. So a hamburger, for example, might not be such a pleasurable thought anymore. But during the experiment, you might also get thoughts about, for example, the chair. So the chair might actually, during the experiment, change in meaning for you. Um, could that, for example, explain why you don't get such a high uh, effectiveness of, of detecting the chair in your brain? And are there ways of avoiding that actually during the studies? Well, this whole field of brain reading um, inherits a problem from psychology. And that is that psychology doesn't have a good answer to find out what a person is thinking either. So if you're going off daydreaming, thinking your thoughts, yeah, think about a chair and all the different ways you can think about chairs, you're sitting on a chair, you're leaning on a chair, someone else is sitting on a chair, etc., etc., then this... Um, is something that you um, uh, can't really measure this flow of thought without interfering with the person. I need you to report to me think, thinking loud. That's the technique that it was called in early days in psychology. Um, you'd have to tell me what you're thinking, and that's going to interfere with the process. The, the problem is that brain reading inherits a problem from psychology, and that is that we can only train the classifier with the brain activity labels with the thoughts if we know the labels well enough, and if they're not so good, it kind of that's the, then you then you have a problem. So you kind of uh, you're kind of dependent on the psychology working out. Now, psychology doesn't have a very good answer to these kind of questions either. You, know, you just rely on a certain way of measuring a person's thoughts, for example, with a questionnaire or with button pressing and things like that, and you have exactly the same uncertainties in every psychological experiment. Thank you. Uh, are these uh, brain reading uh, experiments possible with intelligent animals? What kind of animals? Intelligent ones. Oh, intelligent animals. Wow, define, please define intelligence. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say no, because you'd need to find out uh, what the animal is thinking. It's a very similar question to the one, or it's related to the question before. If you want to find out something about the mental state of a person, then you need to kind of first train the computer with examples of brain activity and know what they're thinking. Now, what you could do is you could use a very rough computer trained on human brain activity and possibly use it on a monkey and have a guess at what they might be thinking. Um, but I think that would be very difficult because um, the brains of uh, even closest neighbors uh, is very different to ours. So I, I don't think that's going to be possible that easily. I think basically the question about whether animals have experiences or not is a question of faith. It depends on how you define your criteria for assigning whether animals have mental states or any being has mental states or not. I think it's a ma matter of faith, largely. Um, I don't mean religious faith. I mean something where you can argue, but there is a there is a element in there that there's no final justification for it. I think we have to stop here and uh, give some word to you. Thank you for uh